It's now my privilege to introduce our speaker. Robert Zellick has had a truly extraordinary career, notable in particular for his deep and abiding commitment to public service. He is a graduate of Swarthmore College and a double graduate of Harvard, studying at both the Kennedy School of Government and the Law School. His service in US government includes senior appointments in the Treasury Department, the State Department, the White House, and in the cabinet from 2001 to 2005 as US trade representative. He has played leading roles in shaping policy and history on issues ranging from German unification to world trade. He's also worked in the private sector as a vice chairman at Goldman Sachs. He became the 11th president of the World Bank on July 1st, 2007. I would also like to mention one other thing about Robert Zellick that doesn't appear on his official biography. Uh, in addition to his contributions as a policymaker and institutional leader, he's one of the world's leading thinkers about global problems and long-term solutions. In sept September 2008, he gave the keynote address at the annual conference of the International Institute for Strategic Studies in Geneva. I was in the audience for that speech, which focused on the linkages between fragile states, security, and development. As that address demonstrated, he is in the vanguard in thinking in an inclusive, integrated way about the challenges of poverty, development, security, sustainability, education, governance, and globalization. It's a complex equation, but that's the world in which we live. Robert Zellick is uniquely positioned to help us crack the code. His address today is entitled Beyond Aid. Ladies and gentlemen, Robert Zellick. Thank you, Dean. It's my pleasure. <laughs> well, I want to thank uh, Dean Brown and the faculty and the students. I gather you've just been back for a couple of weeks, so hope I'm not uh, interrupting your class time too seriously. Um, but also, uh, all those involved with uh, George Washington University, I'm very pleased to have the opportunity uh, to be with you. In a village in the mountains of Guizhou Province, China, people assemble to discuss the future. They don't want handouts. They don't want policy prescriptions. They certainly don't want lectures from visiting dignitaries. They want a chance. They're ready to leave their past behind. Are we? Two eminent Harvard professors of government and history, uh, Richard Neustadt and Ernest May, combined their experience in a book that was titled Thinking in Time. So-called lessons of history, they argued, were often misused and led to bad decisions. History was better, they said, for helping people to think in time streams by considering present issues within a continuum of experience and future possibilities. So what questions should we be considering in the uncertain autumn of 2011? And how do today's challenges relate to what has gone before? The World Bank Group's upcoming annual meetings are a distant descendant of a gathering in 1944 when representatives from 44 states met in Bretton Woods, New Hampshire. That historic conference laid the groundwork for three projects that form the basis of what we still refer to today as the Bretton Woods system. A project for the International Monetary Fund to finance short-term imbalances and in international payments so as to manage adjustments in exchange rates and to avoid currency competition and capital outflows that could break economies and societies. A project for the International Bank for Reconstruction and Development, today's World Bank, to make long-term capital available to states so countries could grow and buy from one another. And a project to reduce barriers to international trade, to foster open markets, to resist downward spirals of retaliatory protectionism and economic conflict. The architects of the Bretton Woods system created a model for their world. Let's take a moment to recall that world. In that world, developed economies' share of global GDP was about 80%, with the United States alone accounting for 40%. In that world, developed economies accounted for two-thirds of global trade. In that world, most of today's developing countries were still colonies. 
For almost 70 years now, the multilateral architecture of 1944 has persisted. It's creaked and it's grown with currency and oil shocks in the 1970s, developing countries' debt debacles in the 1980s, and expansions and crashes in the 1990s, but the system has remained broadly intact. For all its weaknesses and critics and patchovers, the Bretton Woods system provided the enabling environment for the greatest era of growth and the largest, most successful economic transformation over the shortest period of time in world history. But the Bretton Woods system itself is not inviolate, it's not cast in stone. The key insight that the founders of Bretton Woods left us was the need for wisdom to recognize when something qualitatively new is going on and for the wit and the will to face and accommodate what's new, to act boldly, decisively, yet cooperatively. Today, history's warning lights are flashing again. Red, yellow, and yes, some green. Will we face the challenges of 2011 with denial, with our heads stuck in the sand? Will we face them with blame and acrimony, obscuring the potential? Or will we face them squarely, constructively, creatively? Will we reason from experience, think afresh for our own times? As with every great historical shift, we need to ask questions about what's really going on. Tectonic plates are shifting. In the 1990s, developing countries accounted for about a fifth of global growth. Today, developing countries are driving the engine for global, the global economy. In the 1990s, developing countries accounted for a little more than 20% of global investment. Today, they account for about 45%. Some forecasters estimate that by 2025, six major emerging market economies Brazil, China, India, Indonesia, the Republic of Korea, and the Russian Federation would collectively account for more than a half of all global growth. Already we live in a world where if China's 32 provinces were countries, they would be among the 33 fastest growing countries in the world over the past 30 years. Today China is consuming over half the world's cement almost half the world's iron ore and steel and pigs and a third of its eggs. As China shifts from building a foundation of growth, some of this demand for minerals and materials will ease. But India will be the next to gear up. This is not the 1944 world. But beware of assuming straight line trends. As China's leaders know, the country's successful growth model is unsustainable. China is recognizing that it needs to deal with the challenges of environmental degradation, inequality, resource use, demographics, productivity growth, and over-reliance on foreign markets. If China reaches $16,000 of income per person by the year 2030, a reasonable possibility, the effect on the world economy would be equivalent to adding 15 South Koreas and it's hard to see how that result would be sustainable within a model of export and investment-led growth. I'm also skeptical of predictions of advanced economies' inevitable decline. With credible and definitely possible action, not just short-term fixes, on debt and deficits to restore confidence, and with a focus on structural and tax reforms to spur private sector growth, to boost productivity and create jobs, Advanced economies can turn around and power ahead. Predictions of inevitable stagnation and decline have time and again proven to be wrong. Nor is it a time to say that developed countries can no longer afford to face up to challenges beyond their borders. In 1947, in the United States of President Harry Truman, an average American earned less than one-third of what each American produces today. If the generation of 1947, with less than one-third of a wealth per person, could face the world boldly, shouldn't we be able to do the same? Americans, Europeans, Japanese, and other developed world countries play vital roles in innovation, investment, technology, security, and yes, development. 
their contributions still provide the underpinnings for the current international system. It's in the self-interest of the major developed states and in the global interest to be with others the architects of the future. Something fundamental is going on, but the lesson is that we must modernize, not abandon multilateralism. Something fundamental is going on, but the lesson is that we must democratize development, not retreat behind borders or close ourselves off to the false warmth of old verities. The lesson is that we must change our old concepts and constricting labels, not our multilateral commitment. Just listen to those labels for a moment. First world and third world, north and south, developed and underdeveloped, rich and poor, them and us. The language of development has been the language of old hierarchies, old world, old order, and not without a whiff of hypocrisy. When countries that produce almost 50% of their electricity from coal tell poorer countries with no energy alternatives that they cannot use coal, what are they really saying? Do what I say, not what I do. When countries with large fiscal deficits preach fiscal discipline to poor countries, what are they really saying? Do what I say, not what I do. When countries pay homage to free trade, but hold back developing countries with barriers, what are they really saying? Do what I say, not what I do. A do what I say, not what I do world will fracture to the detriment of all. The old ways can and must change. And already we're seeing the signs of change. Around the world, it's no longer European, Japanese, or American models that developing countries are seeking to emulate. The Mexican and Brazilian conditional cash transfer systems are being looked to for their innovation in keeping children in school, improving infant and maternal mortality, and overcoming poverty without breaking budgets. Singapore's combination of an open economy, services cluster, anti-corruption, and relentless adaptation to changing conditions is drawing adherents worldwide. India's model for information technology services is being copied across Africa. Relationships among developing countries are changing the development world as we knew it. In the 1990s, developing countries imported 15% of their merchandise from other developing countries. Today, it's three times that amount. In 2008, South-South foreign direct investment accounted for one-third of total FDI going to developing countries, and that share is growing. Today, it's likely near 40%. And developing countries are no longer just the recipients of aid. They're also providers. In 2008, new emerging donors contributed between 12 and 15 billion US dollars in development aid. That's equivalent to 10 to 15% of the amount provided by traditional developed country donors. And that's likely a conservative estimate. Of course, developing countries are beset with problems too. Developing countries are understandably sensitive about assuming new responsibilities thrust upon them. So what does this mean for the future? The new normal will be no normal. The new normal will be dynamic, not fixed, with more countries rising and shaping the multilateral system. Some states may falter, too. The rising economies will be joining new networks and diverse combinations and changing patterns. These new networks are going to be displacing old hierarchies. The new normal will be about countries continually earning their place in world economic affairs, not presuming it because of past standing or official prerogatives. The new normal will be fluid and sometimes volatile, but also more opportunities for countries to benefit from the global economy. The new normal will be about lifting growth, not just shifting growth, creating new jobs as old ones slip in value, capturing the potential of sustainable and green growth, stimulating the private sector to innovate, create new technologies, and meet changing needs. The new normal will be about smart economic power, the successful will be alert to learn from other ideas and suggestions of all countries, regardless of old labels. The new normal will be about voice, 
of women in their communities, of citizens in their countries, of states in the international system. As we've seen in the Middle East and North Africa, it'll be about social accountability, government transparency, civil society. It'll be about citizens who are changing our world even as we race to catch up. We must support them. Adapting to this new world is not about modest shifts in voting power at the IMF or World Bank Group boards. It's not about developing countries being instructed by developed countries. And it's not about north-south zero-sum politics of complaining and blaming. Adapting to this new world is about recognizing that we must all be responsible stakeholders now. In an interdependent global economy, yes, we need China to be a responsible stakeholder. We need China to be a responsible trading partner, to move towards a responsible exchange rate system, to offer intellectual property protection, to make responsible investments, and to pursue responsible environmental policies. But this is not just about China. Europe, Japan, and the United States must be responsible stakeholders too. They have procrastinated too long on taking the difficult decisions, narrowing what choices are left to a painful few. The global economy has entered a new danger zone with little running room as European countries resist difficult truths about the common responsibilities of a common currency. Japan has resisted structural reforms that could retool its sputtering economic system. The United States is facing record peacetime deficits with no agreed approach in sight for cutting the drivers of debt. It's not responsible for the Eurozone to pledge fealty to a monetary union without facing up to either a fiscal union that would make monetary union workable or accepting the consequences for uncompetitive debt burden members. It's not responsible for the United States to falter in facing fundamental issues such as unsustained growth and entitlement spending, the need for a pro-growth tax system, and a stalled trade policy. Unless Europe, Japan, and the United States also face up to their responsibilities, they'll drag down not only themselves, but the global economy. Emerging markets will not sit on the sidelines. They'll not go back to the voiceless, powerless, hierarchical world of 1944 of leaders and followers and spheres of influence. The insight from 1944 is the need for leadership, for reasoning our way to a changed multilateral system. The time for muddling through is over. If we do not get ahead of events, if we don't adapt to change, if we don't rise above short-term political tactics or recognize that with power comes responsibility, then we will drift in dangerous currents. That's the lesson of history for all of us, developed and emerging countries alike. But if we get it right, the potential is enormous. Over the last 25 years, the share of poor people living in developing countries has been cut in half. In just four years, child mortality rates have fallen by 25% in 18 African countries. Over the 10 years before the financial crisis, economies in sub-Saharan Africa were growing by 5 to 6% on average, and most Africans have already recovered and moved beyond pre-crisis levels. We've seen the power of the private sector in the $77 billion that has been invested in telecom networks in sub-Saharan Africa over the last decade, boosting the number of mobile subscribers from under 10 million to nearly 400 million. We've seen it in the rapid rise of equity funds and other investors looking to put private capital to work in developing countries. My point is a basic one. Today, we're seeing economic, trade, and financial interdependence that was incomprehensible in 1944. We're seeing innovation, scientific breakthroughs, and communications incomprehensible in 1944. We're seeing supply chains and logistics systems that range across continents and oceans. We're seeing multiple poles of growth with new economic powers and a South-South development pattern. None of these developments were envisioned in 1944. 
Can we now combine these changes with a modernized multilateralism to herald a new world economy beyond dependence, beyond a simplistic division between donors and recipients, a world beyond aid? Prior to the Bretton Woods systems, foreign aid assisted primarily with humanitarian crises, famines, floods, earthquakes, or people that were fleeing conflicts. With the devastation of World War II and then decolonization, it seemed useful to jumpstart private investment with aid that might be otherwise limited because of insufficient domestic savings or capital controls or weak conditions. And aid became a currency to gain support in a bipolar Cold War competition. That 1944 world has changed dramatically. It's time to think about aid anew. These changes don't mean that there's no longer a place for aid, nor that developed countries should not honor their aid commitments, nor that we should disregard what aid has achieved. For millions of people around the world, that aid remains a life or death matter. It remains a valuable boost enabling countries to climb the ladder of growth. And much remains to be done to achieve the Millennium Development Goals. Much remains to be done to reach the bottom billion the almost 1.5 billion people today who live in countries that are affected by fragility and conflict and violence. None of these countries has yet achieved a single Millennium Development Goal. But aid is not for life. Nor should aid be what developed countries give with one hand while with the other they exclude developing countries from agricultural or other trade markets or restrict their access to sustainable energy. In a world beyond aid, assistance would be integrated with and connected to global growth strategies, fundamentally driven by private investment and entrepreneurship. The goal would not be charity, but a mutual interest in building more poles of growth. In a world beyond aid, sound G7 economic policies would be as important as aid as a percentage of GDP. In a world beyond aid, G20 agreements on imbalances, on structural reforms, on fossil fuel subsidies and food security would be as important as aid as a percentage of GDP. In a world beyond aid, the advanced emerging markets would assist those behind with experience, their own open markets, investments, and new types of assistance. In a world beyond aid, new financial instruments would ensure smallholder farmers against drought or countries against hurricanes, would create local currency bond markets and leverage new equity investments and develop new hedging instruments for developing countries. In a world beyond aid, support for innovation and scientific breakthroughs would develop drought resistant, more nutritious and better yielding crops, create efficient non-carbon energy sources and find new life-saving vaccines. Developed countries need to recognize their self-interest in helping developing countries get on the pathway to sustainable growth. They need to honor their commitments. But we also need to recognize that the climate for aid will grow colder as donor countries struggle with debts. Taxpayers have a right to know that the World Bank and other development institutions are responsible stakeholders too. We need to do a better job at demonstrating the effectiveness of aid, showing value for money, and pointing to results. We need to leverage aid more effectively, and we need to expand the contributors by involving more stakeholders. So what might a world beyond aid mean in practical terms? At the country level, moving beyond aid means mobilizing and leveraging domestic savings and revenues transparently. It means good governance, openness, and transparency, facilitating strong citizen involvement and voice. It means investing in one's people, including access to efficient safety nets, basic services and quality education linked to training and jobs, requiring public institutions and officials to deliver, not just represent interests. It means encouraging entrepreneurs, small businesses, private investment, and innovation. 
It means investing in infrastructure to build the basis for future productivity, including through innovative public-private partnerships. It means investing in connectivity while gathering data and sharing information. In the new world economy, good data and information will be at least as important as financial assistance. At the international level, it means multilateral innovation to forge progress on open trade and investment, access to energy, food security, competition and services, and climate change. Not always waiting for all to join, but moving ahead where coalitions of progress are possible. It means using the multilateral system, including the G20, to look at new policy and financing possibilities with roles for all. For the World Bank Group, moving beyond aid means continuing to transform ourselves to become an open knowledge partner, drawing from, researching, customizing, and sharing solutions from around the world. The World Bank Group would be an investor and an intermediary for investment in building markets and in institutions and in capacity, whether of governments or businesses or civil society. It would be a catalyst for action in a democratized development model. It would be an agent that advances multilateral solutions. And it would be a champion of inclusive and sustainable growth. Three years ago, I proposed one such innovation. I called it a 1% solution, whereby sovereign wealth funds would invest 1% of their assets in Africa's growth. Today, IFC, our private sector arm, has a new asset management company, and its funds total over $4 billion, over $3 billion of which come from outside investors such as sovereign wealth funds and pension funds. So today, I want to propose another idea that could bring us closer to a world beyond aid, a 50% solution. Women make up 50% of the global population and 40% of the global workforce. In Africa, women are the backbone of their communities. They represent the majority of farmers and produce 80% of the continent's food. Yet women own only 1% of the world's wealth. Women and girls in developing countries are less likely than men to survive infancy, to survive early childhood, or to survive their reproductive years. Women are less likely to be paid for their labor, to farm profitable crops, or to own assets such as land. And yet the evidence of women's human, social, and economic potential is overwhelming. We know that gender equality is smart economics that countries with gender equality tend to have lower poverty rates, that a child's chance of survival is much greater if the income goes through the hands of the mother, that simply by giving women more control over agricultural inputs, agricultural productivity could be increased by as much as 20%. This is not just about economic potential. I believe gender equality is a right, not just a resource. Nor is gender equality just about developing countries. Around the world, one in 10 women will be sexually or physically abused by a partner or someone she knows over the course of her lifetime. We can talk about consigning old labels like North and South and developed and underdeveloped, first world and third world to history, but it's still a them and us world. Now some may ask, how does this relate to a world beyond aid? Simply put, it's about changing policies and empowering every person, man or woman, not just providing aid packages. We can give aid to better support women and girls, and we should, but aid alone is not enough. We will not release the full potential of half the world's population until globally we address the issue of equality until countries and communities and households around the world acknowledge women's rights and change the rules of inequality. Giving women the right to own land, giving women the right to own and run and operate a business, giving women the right to inherit, giving women greater earning power, giving women greater control over resources within their households. These could boost children's health, could increase girls' education, 
could leverage entrepreneurship and economic productivity and closer, take us closer to a world without aid. This would truly be democratizing development. Since I became president of the World Bank Group some four years ago, I've talked about the importance of modernizing multilateralism to better recognize and reflect the shifts that are taking place in the world today. I've talked about the need to democratize development for all, north, south, east, west, rich and poor, men and women, that they can play a part in designing, executing, and continually improving development solutions. I've talked about the need to make openness and transparency and accountability key features, not only of the World Bank Group, but of government policy across the world. And I've talked about the need to forge a new social contract, to recognize that investments in citizens' voice and civil society and social accountability are as important to development as investments in firms and farms and factories. Today, I've tried to outline how a multilateral system, better reflecting the economic realities of today, more rooted in a notion of stakeholder responsibility, more connected to private sector and civil society networks, more committed to practical problem solving and innovation, could unleash a world beyond aid, a world that highlights prosperity, not palliatives, potential, not patronage, dignity, not dependency. There are some who may argue that this approach is too radical, that it will somehow let developed countries and their aid commitments off the hook. It need not. There are some who argue that this approach may be too risky, that it will give a role to new financial instruments and markets that could get developing countries into trouble. It need not. There are some who may argue that this approach is too premature, that developing countries are not ready to be responsible stakeholders. Are they any less ready than developed economies appear to be? Already today, private sector financial flows dwarf official development assistance. Already, some philanthropic contributions dwarf bilateral government aid. And new players and new donors are already transforming the aid world as we know it. We need to be thinking in time, drawing insights from those intrepid multilateralists at Bretton Woods, yet asking questions to distinguish the circumstances of our time and acting with the aim of preparing for times to come. It's time to catch up. It's time to assume our responsibilities. It's time to create for the future, not pine for the past. Thank you. President Zellick, thank you very much for that extraordinary sweeping set of remarks. Uh, you combine strategic vision with pragmatism. And your remarks on the importance of gender equality, I think, resonate especially powerful, powerfully here at GW. Uh, just in the last few years, we've launched a global gender initiative and a global women's forum at the Elliott School. And we're in the process of launching a university-wide global women's institute. And so here at GW, we say, do what we say and follow what we do. Good. Uh, we're, we're very much with you on that. Uh, we have some time for questions, and so we can open things up uh, for short questions from the audience. Please introduce yourselves uh, as we uh, take questions. And please do keep your questions in the form of a question rather than a speech. Um, I think we're ready to begin. I see a question here in the front. Thank you so much for your comments today. Ad addressing some of the ideas you had at the beginning. Could you give your name? And beg your pardon. Joanna Spear, I'm a professor in the Elliott School. You've just asked politicians to be incredibly brave and to not think about narrow re-election and to not think about power status, but to really push forward into the future. How are you going to give them the incentives and the bravery to actually follow through with changing architecture in those ways? Well, I think um, good policy can also be good politics. 
Um, and let me give you an analogy. Um, the dean mentioned a little over 20 years ago, uh, I represented the United States in the negotiations for Germany's unification, the two plus four process. And I've thought about that as you consider the events uh, of the Eurozone today because um, Chancellor Kohl was the Chancellor of Germany at that time. He was also the founder of the Monetary Union. Uh, he had a phrase that he used, uh, which I've always liked, um, which is that uh, it's a quote from Bismarck. It's that the sign of a statesman is somebody who recognizes fate as she rushes past and grabs onto the hem of her cloak. So it's the notion that part of a good politician rising to a statesperson is somebody who is astute enough to recognize the moment of the times and move with it. And if you go back in 1989, there were a lot of voices in Germany to say nothing of Europe that thought German unification was a pipe dream. But he, he moved with it. I personally think that the Eurozone is now at a similar stage, and this is why I've said the time for muddling through is past. I think uh, for the success of the Eurozone, for the success of the countries, for the success of political leaders' legacy, they have to now move to the point where they face some of the fundamental decisions that I talked about today. And um, you can, in the case of that particular, you can address some of the issues with liquidity support from the European Central Bank or from the EFSS for a while. But the fundamental choice to be made is, are you going to have a fiscal union that matches the monetary union? If so, there's lots of different ways that that could be constructed. Who will start to set out the design? And in a case like Europe, of course, you have to bring along other parties. So Franco-German engine, Kohl was very effective at using the European Commission. Other, you now have a bigger uh, sort of overall European Union to bring along. Um, and if you don't know that, then are you ready for the consequences for those that are flailing? I could take the case of the United States. I think that, frankly, it, and I'll give uh, <laughs> at least some basis, I, I also took part in national elections. And so I understand the tactical and I understand the short-term calculations. My own sense is that um, the lack of confidence, actually, that I started to refer to when I was in Australia, as a matter of fact, in August, uh, about economic leadership was the fact that um, people are looking for leaders to give them the straight story and some sense of direction. So as I discussed in the case of the United States, you're having a lot of debates about cutting what technicians call the discretionary spending, um, the year-by-year -year annual budgets, as opposed to dealing with the rate of increase of the entitlements programs, primarily Social Security and health care programs. That's not going to address the fundamental issue. And so if somebody really wants to send a signal to markets and send a signal of direction about the future of the country, somebody has to lead on those issues. And you know, part of the challenge of a good politician uh, is knowing when to set out that leadership course and kind of how to bring people along. But I'll pose the alternative. If you muddle through and your economy continues to decline or the Eurozone moves to a crisis and you don't have a plan, that's not very good for politics or one's legacy. So your question is a very apt one because I think particularly here at a policy school, you know, it's not pie in the sky designs. I've spent my life in trade and security and other areas trying to come up with things that have a sense of strategy but also a sense of how you get there and how you build political support. But I believe at this point in the international system, and that's why I drew the analogy to 1944, this is the moment where people are going to have to do that, but they need to recognize the changed circumstances, the key one being the rise of the emerging markets. And there's potential there. There's huge potential in that arrangement. But uh, by sticking your head in the sand, you're not going to deal with a problem, whether it's a company or a country. OK. Um, well, right here, since the microphone is here. I'm Christina Fink. I'm a professor in the Elliott School. And I'd like to ask you how What's you see discipline? Uh, international development studies. Okay. Um, could you talk a little bit about how you see the World Bank restructuring itself and the policies that it's promoting in order to enable the achievement of your vision? Well, there's a multiplicity. But um, I think the starting point is to recognize that while we're called bank, that our primary purpose is not really finance. And that's a little misleading for people because they're used to banks uh, playing a financial role. As I uh, alluded to, when the World Bank Group is an institution, because we have private sector arms and different public sector arms is most effective, it really is able to combine three activities. 
it's able to take knowledge and learning and experience, increasingly from developing countries to other developing countries, and be able to customize it to help people come up with solutions. Second, what distinguishes us from the OECD or university is we do have money and we can, we can come up with a variety of different innovative forms of doing that. As I talked about now with our asset management corporation, a new intermediary for private investment uh, in addition to the way we used to do private investment as well as public sector insurance and guarantees and other contingent arrangements. But third, um, we've done say almost $200 billion of commitments since the start of the financial crisis. Big number, but in the larger scheme of things, in, not all that significant compared to trillions. So what we have to try to do is, is use those projects and funds to have a leveraged effect, to have an effect on building markets, maybe domestic currency bond markets, maybe microinsurance markets, maybe microfinance markets, maybe equity markets, or institutions or capacity, and therefore be able to leverage it further. Now there's one other sort of key aspect that I would, and, and to do that as an institution, we have to see ourselves as a problem-solving, client-oriented institution. And the World Bank has got wonderful staff. It's got some incredibly trained uh, people. But one of the qualities that I've been trying to encourage is that when a client has an issue, the job is not to analyze the problem. It's to solve the problem. It's not enough to bring the textbook solution. And this brings us to the world of political economy, which I think is important for development economists to understand. What are the institutional constraints? How do you try to transform and work with the leaders given the challenges and the context they face? So it's a client orientation. But another piece, and this is I think critically important for big old institutions uh, you know, created at the uh, mid 20th century, is the openness and transparency agenda. So we're the first multilateral institution that created a Freedom of Information Act. Um, and uh, it's great for challenging us, opening the system, have, may, having people see that uh, behind the walls of this building not too far away, it's actually not all that uh, secretive. Um, and uh, a dimension that I think will even have more power that I was talking about with the dean is uh, this open data, open information initiative. So we've opened up 7,000 data sets going back decades, free of charge, opened up competition for apps for development, and this has connected the bank to people in ways we never would have foreseen before. Um, and it also picks up on this notion of democratizing development, that it's not sort of a hierarchical system with experts from uh, no apologies, but fine universities um, just coming up with uh, the right solutions, but instead engaging people uh, in the countries. And let me just give you a practical example. We've worked with Google on a, uh, uh, a, a mapping system. So you can get on our website, and we have this for our, our IDA countries, the 79 poorest, and we'll have it for all the countries by the end of the year. You pull up a country, and then you can just point your finger and learn the data about a certain project. And before too long, I want to have the interactivity so that people in that community on a handheld device could say, well, this is what you think's happening, but let me tell you what's really happening, which is probably the best way to also get at some of the governance and corruption issues. Uh, and so the themes that I've talked about, about transparency, governance, social accountability, engaging civil society, those aren't just words. They have to be an integrated part of how the institution changes its interaction. Okay, we have another microphone over here. Got a student? Um, yeah, maybe here in the front. Hello, uh, my name's Andrea Ruiz and I'm a senior at the Elliott School uh, undergraduate program. And um, in your speech you talked a lot about reformatting the world of multilaterals. Um, what is your vision for the World Bank and its role or its interaction with other multilateral organizations. And, yeah. yeah. Well, going back to you know, my opening comments where I referred to the fact that in 1944 you created these three institutions, one for trade, one for reconstruction development, uh, one for the monetary system. You know, keep in mind the when the bank was first created, it was the International Bank for Reconstruction Development. The first loan was to France. Um, and so uh, it actually didn't start to work with developing countries for a few years. And so the whole model, the whole world economy, that's why I just tried to touch on it in broad brush structs, was so different than today. 
And in most basic form, that was a system whereby the capital flows were so limited and restricted, or the expectations for domestic savings were such, that people thought you needed to be able to have this external source of, of capital because you wouldn't get it uh, locally. Increasingly, the bank needs to see itself as part of a network system. So it may be UN agencies. So we may work with um, uh, some of the UN agencies right now with the Horn of Africa or with the World Food Program on some of its initiatives. Um, or, since I talked about uh, reconstruction, um, as the Dean mentioned, Dean Brown mentioned, um, in a sense, reconstruction today means the bottom billion, the broken states, the, the Cote d'Ivoires, um, the Afghanistans, the unique changes of integrating security, development, and governance. And one reason I gave the speech you referred to at IISS was that I've been in those different universes, and I was quite surprised they didn't really communicate. So right. the soldiers would say, oh, well, we need to create jobs quickly so people can be put to work. The economists would say, oh, those are make-work jobs. They're not worthwhile. You know, how do we try to connect these different uh, pieces? That means working with, um, as part of this network, not only the regional development banks, the UN agencies, but private sector in developing and developed countries. It means working with NGOs. So, in the last significant speech I gave before our spring meeting, I talked about how the bank uh, needs to play a role in helping develop some of the civil society groups in some of these countries, which is um, a little different for the bank because we're used to, we're, we focus our, by our charter on support for the governments or through IFC through the private sector. So we're looking at ways that we can be able to try to support some of the civil society groups to support the transparency, but also uh, make the network differently. So. We need to see ourselves as a catalyst in a much different universe, and you have to understand the changing circumstances. So just to take this other one I referred to, you know, I, when I came to the bank, the standard inter intermediation model, for those of you who speak in financial services term, was we raise debt and then we'd either make loans or equity investments. So um, I took the advice of Willie Sutton, the famous bank robber, who when asked why he robbed banks said that's where the money is. Um, and I thought, well, how can we tap sovereign wealth funds? Because that's where the money is. And so we created an asset management corporation and now have an equity fund of a billion dollars that's starting to do investments in Africa and uh, uh, Latin America. And we've created other funds. So that recognizes the whole change of the financial world. If you think back, and you know, I always recommend economic history to people or any history, it's a good reference point. That would have been inconceivable in 1944, 45, or 1950, or 1960, or 1970. Closest you got was the oil shock where people were trying to uh, take the oil money from the Gulf states and put it back through major banks and lend it to Latin America, and that created a mess. So these are the types of things where part of my message today is some of the principles that people talked about in mid-20th century remain very important, but the world has changed. So how do, you, how do you maintain the principles, but in a very different environment? And the reason I stress that is that there's always tendencies in a country, any country, but a big country like the United States, to say, well, you know, we'll go it by ourselves. We don't need these other players. You know, it's time to return home. We don't need to deal with multilateralism. That's a dirty word, so on and so forth. I don't think that's right. And I think the US will be more effective in the world if it learns how to modernize and, and uh, upgrade its own interaction with multilateral institutions. I think we have time for one more question uh, here in the middle. Uh, thank you very much for your speech. Uh, my name is Zhao Zhou Ye. I'm a Chinese student at the uh, Idaho School of Inter International Affairs. Major Where are you from in China? Uh, Jiangxi province. Yeah. Uh, my question is, you talked about China being a responsible stakeholder. And I'm just wondering, from a Chinese perspective, what do you think are the incentives that will encourage China to be a responsible stakeholder? And what might be the factors that might disencourage China to be a responsible stakeholder? Thank you. Good question. Um, I was um, building off a speech that I gave in 2005 when I was at the US government. And I was talking about US policy towards China. And the theme of that speech was encouraging China to be a responsible stakeholder. The core logic of that speech uh, remains true today, which is that over the past 30 years, China's had this incredibly successful growth, um, about 10% a year over 30 years. Um, and I had the good fortune of 
visiting China in 1980 when I was living in Hong Kong, so I've seen with my own eyes what an unbelievable difference it makes. And the reason I asked you where you're from is when I visit China, I always try to get beyond meetings in Beijing. So um, just last week, I was in Heilongjiang province up in the northeast and try to get a sense of different developments uh, or in Guizhou, where I referenced where I was last year, one of the poor provinces in the southwest. Huge changes. But part of the message was that China, too, benefited from this system that was created after World War II. The whole logic of Deng Xiaoping's opening was to leverage off this international economic system and do it in a pragmatic way. So the first and perhaps core point is, is that China benefited from the security stability, it benefited from the trade system, it benefited from the international financial flows and investment, a lot of the foreign direct investment that went into China that brought technology, created jobs. So it had an interest, a self-interest, in perpetuating but also adapting and modernizing that system. And as China grows larger and bigger part of the world economy, that's only more so. So what happens in the Eurozone is going to affect what happens in China or what happens in the United States. Now, this is true for China. It's true for other emerging market countries as well. But what is difficult, and this is where the developed countries need to figure out with the developing countries the right balance or structure of this, is that you still have 75% of the people earning under $2 a day live in so-called middle-income countries. So when I go to China and I talk about sharing responsibilities and others, they say, well, yeah, but we're st we've still got a lot of poor people to deal with and we still have a lot of development challenges. That's a reasonable point. But at the same time, my counterpoint is China has grown so successfully and is now so large, it can't ignore uh, the role in the international system. So beyond that, you really have to take each issue, whether it's climate change, whether it's trading system, whether it's security policy, whether it's monetary affairs. But let me give you a very small and perhaps technical one, but it shows a little bit how this can work in practice. We have a fund uh, for the 79 poorest countries called IDA. Some of you that study development may know this. And it, and, and it gives grants or long-term loans without interest, about 40-year loans, to the 79 poorest countries. Because of that financing model, we have to replenish it every three years. So we just finished the 16th IDA replenishment. You get money and you get commitments for over three years. Um, part of the money comes back from our own profits. Part of it is reflows. Part of it is contributions from developed countries. When I first became president of the World Bank in 2007, uh, China, which no longer received IDA funds but had been an IDA recipient many years ago, made its first contribution about $35 million, and it made another contribution, this time about $130 million. Now, for China, that's significant. Britain and the United States are sort of at the $4 billion level. But I went to the Chinese authorities and said, you know, it's a tough time to be raising donor assistance. It would help if China prepaid some of its IDA funds from the past. So economically, it's, it's, it's not a big cost, but China is prepaying early billions of dollars of its IDA funds. So here's a way that we, we raised $49.3 billion for IDA and IDA 16. And when you can make a couple billion dollars of contributions to reflows, that's very helpful. So this is a way in which an emerging market country can contribute in a slightly different fashion. So part of the challenge, we could go through other examples and climate change as well, that um, it's in the self-interest of China you know, not to have heating that melts the glaciers and, frankly, in the Himalayas and puts a big danger for uh, your country. It's in China's self-interest to have an open trading system so you can continue to benefit from it. It's in China's self-interest uh, to have uh, open capital investment markets. So over time, the RMB will need to move towards an open capital account, which China says it wants to do. And one of the reasons I was in China was China believes it needs to make structural changes, as I alluded to in this uh, speech because it can no longer rely on the pure export-led investment trade model. And those structural changes will help it make the currency changes. So part of this is the whole notion. The reason I got into a little detail here is I've talked in broad thematic terms. But there's hard detail work in making any of these happen. And it requires a little creativity, thinking of something new and diplomacy. But, you know, if you look at world security history, political history, or economic history, that's not totally new. 
Um, and that's the challenge that now faces not only the developed countries, but the emerging markets as well. Thank you. Thanks. 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 President Zellick, that was uh, a tour de force, although in your case I would have to say it's another tour de force uh, since I've, I've heard you speak before. And I think one of the most important lessons you conveyed was that a lot of the changes that are needed are you know, not just the right thing to do, but the, uh, the smart thing to do. One can only hope that leaders around the world will listen as carefully and learn as much as we have over this past hour. Now, I realize that as president of the World Bank, you have to give addresses at many locations around the world. But I do want to remind you that in the future, the most environmentally friendly way for you to give a major address is just to walk down the street <laughs> and join us here Good exercise at, too. at the George Washington University. It's, it's my pleasure on behalf of my GW colleagues and especially on behalf of our students to present you with this small token of our very great appreciation and admiration. Well, thank you very much. Thanks. Let me just say one more word. Um, one closing word, uh, since many of you students have just uh, started uh, the year. Um, one of the reasons that I wanted to come here is the types of things that I'm talking about um, are things that I hope to work on, and I'm sure some of the faculty you have work on. Um, but you really, whatever country you're from, whether you're US or China or others, you have this incredible opportunity to be at this world-class university with people internationally to focus exactly on these questions. And the issues that I'm talking about are not just going to be decided by the chancellors and the presidents and the prime ministers uh, that are in office today. But these are going to go on for a while. These are going to be your issues and your questions. So I think you've really been blessed to have the opportunity uh, to get the education you've had so far and to be here. Uh, but I always like universities because I also think there's a great potential and power that comes from uh, a next generation. And one of the reasons I wanted to say these things is because there will be many of your challenges to address. So thank you. <clears throat>